Welcome to the Iowa City City Council work session, February 21st, 2023. It is 4.10 and welcome. Um, our first agenda item is a presentation and discussion by the Iowa City Community School District for 2024-2025 preschool proposal presentation. We're extremely excited to have you and um, we'll cede the floor. Anything I need to do on the computer or will that go ahead? Okay, Dev knows what to do. All right. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Superintendent Matt Degner. I think I know most of you guys or have met you before. Uh, thanks for having us uh, here this afternoon. Uh, we wanted to just talk to you a little bit about preschool. Uh, we know that we had a chance at the Joint Entities meeting to talk about preschool and a little bit about uh, potential funding source for that. Um, I think what you're going to hear us mostly talk about today is just what we'd like to do around expanding preschool, but where we need some help and why we need some help and what level of support that would require for our community to do that. Uh, we know with uh, you know dec uh, multiple decades long of underfunding of public education and only receiving uh, half time funding per uh, each preschool student, the district is somewhat limited in what we can provide uh, for a preschool experience uh, for our kiddos. And uh, what is being passed around to you is just one data point that shows really the importance of preschool uh, when we look at student achievement, and you'll see. Uh, some data from our FastBridge math assessment that shows students uh, in their performance when they've had a preschool experience and then our students' performance when they haven't had a preschool experience. And uh, what we would like to stand up is really a full day experience and that wouldn't necessarily be a full day, uh, full of the full day full of um, instruction during that time, excuse me, stumbling over my words, I was thinking about our wrap care. Uh, the other half of the day would be the wrap portion. And the reason that is important is because parents are obviously limited in their ability to pick up and drop off kids in the middle of the day whenever that happens. And so that somewhat stunts our enrollment for the amount of students that we can get into a high quality preschool experience with the district. And so what we're gonna talk to you about is what, again, it would take to be able to do that, uh, kind of where we run into some financial difficulties with doing that to see if we could partner with our municipalities to stand up something uh, more significant for our community uh, that we believe of, would be of benefit. So uh, with me uh, this afternoon, you see a couple of our board directors uh, or a few of our board directors, Director Easton, Director Abraham, uh, Vice President Williams, uh, and then we have our Assistant Director of Special Education, uh, Deb Scott, and our uh, Deputy Superintendent, Chase Ramey. So we're all here and happy to answer questions. Deb is gonna work uh, her way through the slides here and do kind of the majority of the log logistics conversation with you. Uh, but like I said, we'll, I'll be happy to respond to any questions you might have. So thanks for, for having us. Good afternoon, and I'm going to walk through the slides that we have. We'll be looking first at our current state so you can get kind of an idea of what our preschool looks like right now, our desired state, and then as uh, Mr. Denger has shared, a municipal contribution and key takeaways. So that's what we're going to walk through right now. Currently, we offer preschool at 18 of the 21 elementary buildings. There are 29 total sessions, 18 a.m. sessions, and 11 p.m. sessions. Our pilot sites are our wrap sites, and you can see in bullet four, our three wrap sites this year are Shimmick Elementary, Hills, and Wickham. Wrap, the wrap care is tuition-based, however, child care assistance may be utilized. Our morning sessions run from Monday through Friday, and you can see the time there on the slide. Our afternoon sessions are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday as well. Transportation is provided by the families at this time unless the child has a speci specified need on their individual education plan. When we look at our kindergarten classes coming in, and the, they register and parents self-report that 280 students in the last school year did not access preschool anywhere. Currently we serve 475 preschool eligible students in our preschools. 114 preschools are served by our affiliated community partner agencies. Our kindergarten enrollment 
for our current school year was 1,035 students. We desire as a school and as a community to provide quality preschool offerings throughout the district to serve the maximum number of children, providing ease of access for families at all times. We desire to provide high quality child care options to increase the access to preschool offerings and continue to pursue funding opportunities to provide child care access for all Iowa City families who qualify for free and reduced lunch. We also always desire to manage our operational costs regarding our preschool services. These are some assumptions that we are working towards to achieve this desired state. Cost is based off an assumption of one preschool classroom at each elementary building that is currently 21 buildings. Each elementary classroom will have both AM and PM sessions for a total of 42 sessions. Each preschool classroom will have wrap care that is available via tuition for all and free for families who need that assistance. Transportation would be provided still to eligible students. If we look at our funding, we have two columns for you to look at today. First was a conservative enrollment, and this was worked on by our uh, school district staff to look at historic enrollments previous to COVID-19. So we are making an assumption of 26 per site, per site in our conservative enrollment, but as always, we would like to fill all of our seats in our preschools. Um, and serve the maximum number of students, and that would be 40 per site, given the guidelines for uh, the state preschool. You can see there the numbers difference if we go with conservative enrollment or the maximum enrollment, the total costs. <coughs> you also see a comparison of the district contribution. Special education, of course, is marked with asterisks because that would vary from year to year, and we are basing that on what we know right now. Funding from the state is from the statewide voluntary preschool dollars that we receive. And you can see the difference there depending on 26 per site or 40 per site. And we are here to let you see that the municipal contributions would need to be that figure in order to make sure that we have our desired state of preschool. Here are some of the operational costs that we are considering. Lead support teachers, we currently have one who supports our preschools now. If we increased our preschool, we are desiring to have two of those uh, staff members. And you can see the cost there and how that is contributed. Early childhood associates are as needed by IEP. So we really can't estimate an additional cost for that because that would be based on student needs. Preschool secretary, preschool IDS are instructional design specialists and those folks help our teachers understand how to use curriculum best, how to instruct best at the preschool level. Instructional materials specifically for preschool, instructional materials for students with special needs, transportation costs, and you can see there are total cost of 817,275 with a district contribution of 560,000 and special ed contributions as well. You can also see, we go on to show you what it looks like if we have um, early childhood teachers based on our conservative enrollment and based on our full enrollment. Early childhood associate costs. If we increased our preschool sites, locations, and number of students, we would want to and desire to have a preschool administrator. Right now, that is shared amongst many staff members for Iowa City. I'm sorry to interrupt. On the, um, both the teacher benefits and, and then the childhood associate, um, can you break that into numbers of actual instructors that you're anticipating or that you were using for the conservative enrollment? I mean, I see 21. I'm assuming that's for the school, correct? Yes. So how, what does that break into for the number of instructors? 
21 is the number of teachers. Of the actual teachers, so just one? Yes, they have an AM session and a PM session, and uh, with ratios, they can instruct okay. the full AM and the full PM. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Supplemental assistance for RAP care, that is our prediction for the need. Transportation costs, district contribution, and again, we have broken it down, and we are looking for that bottom figure from our municipal for contribution. This is provided to you to predict what would be needed and to, to get a locked rate for our municipalities so that we can get our heads wrapped around what does that actually mean for each municipality. And so because we are in Iowa City's municipality today, we're looking at that middle column. What we were able to do is to give you a look at how many students this school year are enrolled from addresses in Iowa City. So then when you look at 279 students, that's what you're looking at. We do also have that asterisk there that this is, of course, varies from year to year. But we did go with the 22-23 school year. So 59% of our students that are in preschool this year are Iowa City um, residents. And then you can see how that will project out cost by student if we were to project out um, to the 488 students. We would project that that would be what would happen if we increased our sites. So some key takeaways before our questions. We truly believe that all students deserve to benefit from high quality preschool services. All students deserve to have their basic needs met. This includes things like food, safe learning, space, trusted adults. Students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch will have access to lunch, wrap care, and transportation to and from school if eligible for a reduced or free rate. Families who do not have those needs will still have access to preschool with wrap care at a cost. So that is our presentation, and we'll take any questions. So one thing I might just uh, say to kind of break it down in your thinking a little bit is if you look back to this slide, the supplemental assistance for RAP care, if we go back to how we're funded for preschool, we receive half-time funding for our preschool students. That means we can pay for the teacher, right, for that half day that's the preschool offering. The other half of the day is really where we need help to keep them on site and provide them a full day experience. And that's the part I was kind of stumbling over at the beginning. But if you notice, those figures basically reflect each other. That The ask that we have of you, right, is for that 1.6 to fill in that gap where we would need help for the wrap care uh, for the FRL students. We would still charge families of means, you know, a, a tuition basis for that wrap care portion. And so this assistance would really provide a free experience then for students that are not able to afford that so they could stay on site for the full day and have access to the high quality preschool for half the day and then provide the wrap care. The district has tried to stand up some pilot sites uh, this year and we'll stand up two more next year. The problem we're running into is we will see a budget shortfall in being able to do those pilot sites. Um, and so it's really not a sustainable model for us or even if there is an element that can be sustained, uh, it really runs on a, on a pretty uh, thin margin about how we can do that and knowing the uncertainty we have around our funding in the next five years. Uh, that that position puts us in a little bit of a tenuous spot that if we would receive an across the board cut or a 0% for our growth one year, that that could be one of the first things we would have to back away from. And that's not a very good guarantee to our family. So I just, I think that's an easy comparison to say, okay, the supplemental assistance for the wrap care, when you look at that budget line is really matching the ask that we're making from the municipality. So that's what we're asking for the help to be able to provide. Could you uh, switch to the section where it was talking about the payments from each municipality? Yeah. So is this, uh, when we're looking in the middle here, the light blue section, are you guys requesting a uh, continual contribution for three years of, nine, of 979,400? 
Is that yeah. what the request is? So we kind of, this this one I would think about like different scenarios as we've tried to break down about how this cost share works between the municipalities if, if we were to move forward with this or if, uh, if we have support from the municipalities. So the first one shows current enrollment based on that current enrollment, what the number would be. Uh, if we just uh, went based on a per pupil amount, the second one's more of a percent share. And the third one would be projecting out almost a cost per student on what we would see that max enrollment would be. I think for your guys' budget planning, it would make sense that you'd want some kind of a lock number for a period of time, recognizing that we would probably have to revisit that number after a period of time, knowing that costs are going to increase um, and distribution of students could also change uh, over a course of time. That was kind of my, my follow-up question was, you know, if we are contributing a maximum number, say this is picked up um, en masse by, by parents in the district, um, what will you guys do to pick up any shortfalls if we have a, a set limit on our contributions? Yeah, so that goes back to the district contrib contribution at the bottom there. We had talked about that 560000 that we would cover. And so if there was some reason during that period of time that we had locked in with you guys what that contribution was going to be, um, you know, our, our guarantee on this would be that we're going to make it work, right? If we had those, those shares in from the different municipalities at that 1.6 number, then the rest of the budget is really ours to make sure we're able to work and deliver on that experience for our students. Um, and that, you know, for us, as we try to factor this in, there's some variables too for, for ourselves on that with transportation costs and um, some elements about hiring staff like Deb walked through with some of that support staff we'd like to have so those would all be budget items we'd have to make it work I hope that answered your mm -hmm. question I have a few questions Matt um, sure. on the share that's Iowa City just to be very explicit um, I think Deb you said Iowa City addresses but it's it is within the corporate boundaries not like an address that says Iowa City correct right so we have a lot of unincorporated Iowa City yep, no, addresses. Okay. Yep. We geocoded those and pulled the, the students' addresses to make sure they were counted towards the right. Perfect. Um, do you know of any districts in Iowa that are getting funding directly from municipalities for this or for any other kind of program? Uh, we had actually, uh, this was our problem of practice uh, with the last uh, Urban Ed Network superintendent meeting, and there were some examples um, where there are, they were talking to us about some of the things we would like to do. Um, I know uh, Mason City is exploring a, a similar model. I don't think it's, it's stood up at this point yet. I also believe Council Bluffs uh, receives some municipal contributions. There'd be a couple more I'd probably want to verify and share with you guys, um, but I know that there's uh, some that are out there uh, where they've tried to do a full uh, experience. Uh, sometimes those are different revenue generators in those different communities about where that money comes from for them to be able to do that. Um, forgetting the district's name now, but it's a it's one that has a casino, and so the casino contributes, and then they're able to do uh, something similar to this. You kind of along those same lines, does the district care if the money comes directly from the city to the district versus, say, into a pooled fund that is addressing other child care needs that might be held somewhere else? I don't, um, like at a United Way or a community foundation or something like that? I think I'd probably want to talk to our... Uh, CFO about that, but I'm not sure why that would matter to us. I mean, if we were able to eventually receive those funds and uh, make sure that we were able to allocate them towards preschool, um, I think that, you know, the important for, part for us is being able to provide the experience for the students. Now, the flow of the money and some of those things, I think we could continue to engage in how that looks um, or wherever the revenue source comes from. But, you know, for us, being able to provide the experience for the kids is the bottom line. And so those logistical considerations, I, I would probably need him part of that conversation, but I think we could probably make that work. How much does this have to be an all or nothing, or do, is it an all or nothing with the various municipality partners? Yeah, that's a great question, Sean. I think that uh, part of what we would have to consider is if one of these partners were not in here, obviously that changes the math, right? And we don't really have a good way to project what that math would look like uh, if somebody wasn't going to contribute or if we would 
then revisit it to say, okay, maybe Iowa City and uh, say Coralville decide to go ahead with it. Well, then what does that new equation look like to be able to provide uh, that wrap care for, for um, students there? It also gets complex a little bit more for us. As you know, our attendance areas are not clean um, between uh, different municipalities. Um, but I, I do think that um, it makes it a lot more difficult if we have a member or two of the municipalities not do that. I have a couple of their non-financial questions. Um, so have parents been, I don't know, surveyed or have you reached out to the community whose, whose kiddos would be impacted and potentially be using this? Have you talked to parents or gotten gauged their interest? Um, yeah, our survey data when we ask our preschool parents about why they do or do not access uh, our preschool experience oftentimes comes back to the half day element of it. Um, and so that's why even the district has tried to stand up those pilots, uh, or look for opportunities to do that. And so um, that data told us that, you know, that anything we can do to have a full day experience would fill that need for them, that that's their top reason for why they don't select into the district preschool experience. And do you know of, of those, how many are um, free and reduced lunch or how many are, I'm just thinking of the way, and it doesn't matter whether it's the school district or child care centers and the way that they work. I mean, there's always sort of a juggling act of subsidizing, you know, the sort of helping to subsidize the, the free and reduced or the CCA along with full paying. And so I'm wondering about that ratio. Um, if there are parents who would be paying full, but for some reason don't have interest in putting their kids in a larger uh, building or a larger, you know, classroom or what have you, how does, I mean, we've got the municipalities conundrum to work out with the, the numbers, but I'm wondering then if we actually got enrollments with parents uh, who are paying or not less paying, I'm just wondering about I the gauging of the interest. I mean, certainly there is the question of the, um, the need for, for a full day. But I can think of a multitude of other reasons why parents would opt out, right? Um, unfortunately, some of it might actually be equity um, on both sides of it. You know, parents who are like, I don't want my kid at school yet, uh, thinking of it that way, or um, who are saying, I would prefer my child to be in a more family environment. And so I'm just wondering if some of those factors have been sort of an if then teased out. And I realize those are kind of in the weeds, but on the flip side, it, it would be interesting to see if you've kind of considered some of those combinations um, because it could impact your numbers and then that could impact sort of how, how we can stand this up, right? Yeah, so a couple of things. One I would think about, again, going back to the, the most frequent response or the data shows us, right, that the reason they're not choosing our experience is because of the full day part. I mean, that's the most compelling reason we get back on that survey data we ask them is because it's not full day. So some of those other things could definitely be contributors for families, but that's the one that we tried to tackle and address as far as the concern. The the subsidizing part, I think that's what makes it difficult about our pilots. This would definitely provide, this model definitely provides the experience for uh, the non-pay families, right? I mean, your contribution would make sure we could provide that experience no matter how many full pay uh, students uh, would decide to enroll. Uh, we feel confident in that, that uh, no matter what that number looks like, if, if we have contributions from municipalities for the non-pay uh, population of students, we will be able to stand up uh, this programming uh, as we go forward. And so I think that that somewhat addresses that concern, but it is a concern for us as we try to stand up the pilot sites because we're exactly doing what you're talking about, mm -hmm. trying to to subsidize the, the no pays based on the folks that can pay. That's our current model. Uh, but that's where I was saying that math gets really thin for us or operates in the negative in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Where would you get, um, I know that during the, the larger presentation to the joint municipalities, um, there was mention of that there would be an RFP process for getting the, the wraparound services. Um, I, there's only one that I can, I mean, would this be multiple centers or, or um, educators who would be going to different elementary schools, or would this all be done under one, under the auspice of one? 
Yeah, I think at this point, I mean, I realize it's an RFP, but those options uh, right now for the pilot sites, it's been Champions that has uh, yeah. I mean, the been awarded that and been able to do that. Um, I think we would need to continue conversations with them to know for sure if they would be interested or able to do all sites. Um, I can imagine that we would have some groups on some of our campuses that would also be interested in that. And so some of it would depend on the way we'd write the RFP, uh, probably some of the feedback we'd get from the larger provider like Champions about their ability to cover all campuses. Um, and then also just trying to be sensitive to community interest that if we had some other folks that wanted to try to provide the wrap at some of our sites, how we're also respectful to that conversation as we go along because uh, we don't necessarily just need to go with champions um, or a large provider across the board either. Matt, do you, do you know the, how private schools in Iowa City are handling this issue? Well, I think that... Um, you know that's that's probably a passion point for us a little bit in uh, in the public district, knowing that uh, as we enter a new environment of school choice and ed savings accounts, that uh, one of the best things we can do for our public schools is to make sure we do have high quality preschool because uh, private schools that is oftentimes uh, one of the first entry points to the private school system is through um, uh, high quality preschool that they are able to provide and they stand up. And so uh, I think that's also created some urgency for us on this conversation, knowing what's changed in the state politic that uh, we have to do this, right? That we feel really compelled that we have to provide a great preschool experience to our students uh, so that we keep our students and that they don't start down that path um, of private school. Obviously, I'm biased about uh, the, that, that part of the equation, so I won't hold back on that. But um, I, I hope that kind of addresses your question. At the joint entities meeting, Matt, we talked about um, conversations maybe that the district has had with child care providers and some specific concerns about, you know, when three and four year olds are pulled into this program or four year olds, I guess, in this case, right, pulled into this program, how that might impact the economics for other providers. Since we've had a while since then, can you just update us if anything in, you know, does that has that impacted the proposal at all? Have there been other conversations or anything further on that concern? Yeah, I, will, I, I would say no. We haven't had additional conversations, and it hasn't necessarily impacted the proposal anyway. Um, I do think uh, back, I think it was uh, Megan's question talking about um, who would provide this type of experience. That could you know, definitely be part of that conversation and how that looks. But I would say we don't really have any kind of a new substantive update around that piece, Laura. Um, Thank you. Lisa, you got some? Um, because I know that this is a really important part about making this all work. Um, I think what's important to note is, and I'm going to show my ignorance with PowerPoint, but um, what we're looking at when we talk about our current state is we're not serving 280 students. That's, that's the gap that we're missing. This program is really targeted at bringing those 280 kids that are currently not receiving preschool into uh, the ability to get access to preschool. When you then look at our current maximum ability, maximum enrollment assumes 840 students, which is really between our current enrollment and the kids that we're missing. It just adds the kids that we're missing. We're not really seeking to go out and disrupt the private preschool system. And we anticipate that some families will stay with their private providers because we see the enrollment in kindergarten at 1,035. So this model assumes that 200 students are going to stay with their private providers. And that's not going to be an economic loss to them. What we're trying to do is target the students that aren't being um, served at all by anyone and provide them an option that's full day, like Matt said, but also if cost is a barrier, as it often is, even with private providers, is giving them a, a, an option where cost isn't a, uh, a barrier. And then also one of the things that Matt um, briefly touched on is with our survey data, one of the other top reasons why we don't have students accessing ICCSD preschool now is transportation barriers. And so this funding model, when we ask for help from the municipalities, it goes towards the wrap, but it also goes towards transportation, uh, targeted towards our free and reduced student uh, school lunch students uh, to make sure that they have a way to get to preschool. And so we think that um, we've put together 
a proposal that targets those 280 kids instead of kids that are already benefiting from preschool. Because uh, those are the kids, you guys, that we have to touch. I mean, that data that you see in front of you, I was blown away. That's not stat state data or national data. That's right here in ICCSD. And what is incredibly clear is that if you don't have preschool, uh, you are going to be behind in your math benchmark testing. And it's not something that you're going to catch up from. Okay, that data is consistent that our, no, our, our kiddos that don't access preschool are behind in kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And so this single program can be a tremendous game changer for those 280 kids that aren't getting services. I think it's a very compelling argument leads me to a question that how are you going to get to those 288? We're Just knowing that the program exists doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, we learned from COVID that there are a number of families who are already behind and they went further in the gaps and were lost, right? So, so I don't mean that as a, a, a warning. I mean it as like, this is an opportunity to say, absolutely, if this is who you want to reach, that seems to be a really important thing that has yep. to happen too as a really... Um, active instrument of, of, of promoting this program. Yep, and we reach them for kindergarten, right? Because those are kids that come to us for kindergarten. So we know we can reach them. We get them the information about how to do kindergarten registration. We get them into the schools. We get them signed up and we get them in the door. We're just gonna do all those same things that we do for kindergarten one year earlier for preschool. But I have full faith and confidence that we're going to be able to find every single one of those families and let them know that if they want it, provided that the funding is there, if they want it, they can access a full day preschool experience at no cost if they qualify. And we'll take them to school and bring them home too if they need help with that. I've got a question about what you just said there. Uh, I mean, what is your outreach just out of ignorance for uh, reaching out to immigrant families that you're trying to get involved with kindergarten? And I'm assuming that you, that you would want to use that same kind of strategy uh, for the for the preschool program. Could could you detail that for us? Yeah, sure. So for you know kindergarten registration, um, we use a, a lot of our same methods that we use to communicate with families throughout, and then and then we have follow up methods that are a little bit more intense or specific. So you're familiar with our student and family advocates. We also have cultural liaisons, um, our ELL teachers um, that are sometimes going to have a point of contact. The good thing is people know about school. What they won't know about is necessarily preschool, right? And so that's where Director Williams said that some of those efforts for us just have to start at a, than a younger group. And, and I think our pilot sites are good data points to the show uh, that we do get kids signed up. We are able to advertise that, that people are looking for those options uh, and that there is a need. And so when we can also couple that with, it's a, it's a free experience uh, if you qualify for a free and reduced price lunch, um, we definitely think that is a, a game changer. But we've had some good uh, evidence of success with uh, being able to reach our immigrant families through those more intentional methods rather than the blast out. I mean, of course, we translate things to our top language and uh, we have those different vehicles um, to try to communicate with them. But I think it just takes some more targeted um, follow-up and intentionality around that communication uh, with them. And, and I think we've built those bridges and relationships to know where to go and how to get that information out. I guess uh, another thing I'm kind of curious about is uh, what your feelings are from the other municipalities uh, who's seeming to be buying in. It's, I, I think it's certainly too early to say who is buying in, but what are your general feelings? Yeah, so I don't want to speak for them, but uh, we've had a couple uh, presentations prior to tonight. We'll meet with University Heights uh, later this evening as well. Um, and, and I think those have been positively received, is the best I can tell you. Um, and, and any of these guys that have been at those meetings can share some more. Uh, we've had board meetings overlapping with those, so I haven't actually attended one of those. But I know the feedback coming back to us has been, again, understand the need. They understand the desire. Um, and I think this idea of being able to be committed to do something together for our community 
community at a time where public ed is uh, really having a difficult time doing uh, positive things or doing new and innovative things, this is something that would be very different. I mean, it almost goes back to Laura's question about what other districts are doing this. There's probably some examples we can draw on, but I, I would also feel uh, you know, supremely confident to be able to tout this as a model you know, in other parts of the state that this is a community and a public district coming together to do new things uh, for the folks in their community that haven't been done before uh, and that they haven't seen. And so I'd love for us to be a model and to be able to show that um, you know, about a way that we can have those partnerships and work together and continue to invest in our public schools that way. So I know I kind of sidetracked there a little bit on you, but I think the reception's been positive. Of course, a lot's gonna come down to you know, how we make all of this work, and we'll get into specific logistical details, but uh, we're committed to, you know, that's, that's just a problem to be solved. That's once the collective commitment is there. Um, again, we feel good about being able to do that part. Do you feel, um, I mean, this is, I know it's, you've been working on this for a long time, um, and that you, in part, are in the business of child care because you already have pr the preschool experience. Um, but I'm wondering if you're in a position that if and as this continues to move forward, you can reach out and work deeply with the child care providers in the area and honestly to allow them because their entire careers have been just in this early education space and understanding the concerns with, I mean, most child cares in the area are not large. They're not champions. They're not, right? Yeah. And so if a swath of their staff leaves to go to a champions because they could, you know, perhaps get a better, you know, deal through it, um, I know that there are some concerns from child care providers, but also just people who are working on it. It's like, you guys know, it's an onion. You, you solve one thing, and then there's another layer of something that has to be worked through. And I would just hope that there could be some, some collaboration to allow some, some troubleshooting, I think, because I, I see this as it, it's an immense and visionary project. But I do worry about the devils in the details and I think that there could be ways in which child care providers and the folks who work in early childhood education, blah, 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 and the, over at the county could, could potentially really help bolster this more um, so that things that were not anticipated could potentially, um, you know, be anticipated, right? Sure, so. no, I think that's a... You know, that's a great point. We have some, uh, again, I, I feel like our relationships in those uh, spots are good. Uh, we do a lot of uh, community partnering with uh, uh, community preschool, too. That's part of our work, mm -hmm. um, you know, with uh, some of the uh, supplemental weighted funding from the state is to work with those community partners. So we have some go-tos for that and what that child care uh, experience looks like. And, and I would say just in, in also trying to disarm them from a little bit, just to Director Williams' point, that really what we're looking for is trying to serve the kids that aren't being served now. I mean, that's where we're trying to fill the void is just finding the 280 <laughs> students that are receiving no preschool option now. We're not trying to take or, you know, steal. I mean, really, we're just approaching this as we're here to serve kids, right? We just want to serve all the kids and give them a great experience uh, so that the gap that's presented there doesn't continue or grow larger uh, through our system because that's the data point I could show you from 712 is what happens after that, right? Is that that data, you know, that data actually gets worse if you haven't had a preschool experience. Uh, unfortunately, we're, you know, it doesn't necessarily shrink down. So that's kind of the urgency point around it and the fact we're just trying to find the students that haven't had this opportunity yet and make sure they get the same, same uh, good start. And just so I'm clear, the 280, that's just the Iowa City part of the district or is 280 district wide? That's district wide. Got it. Yes, wasn't clear. It's confusing because then your enrollment is actually right at 282. 282 yeah, so that's what like, I was yeah. looking at that. <clears throat> same so number. Yeah. Do you have it broken down by school? Say, you know, Horace Mann. Do we know how many students at Horace Mann? I don't know if we've run that exactly, John, to know like how many students in the Horace Mann area weren't. I, we could probably easily break that 280 down and find that out, but we just kind of looked at the district wide profile on that.
I thought some of you maybe would ask the facility conversation. Part of this is, and we maybe we covered that at the, at the joint entities meeting, is remember our sixth graders are going to middle school, and so that's going to generate some, some space uh, in there. And Deb did a nice job of talking about where we have classrooms now and the ability to have that teacher do a morning and afternoon section. But just from a logistical or space consideration, of course, we stated that in some of the assumptions, but I want you to feel confident about that aspect, too. And just, Actually, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, just to be clear on the logistics, a child would enroll in either the morning or the afternoon and have wraparound for the other portion the other of the part. day. Exactly. So in the classroom, it would be just during the preschool instructional period in other parts of the building during wraparound care? Yeah, we'd probably just use another classroom uh, for the wrap portion, and so one would be the... You know, you'd go to this room for the preschool instruction, um, and then you'd have your wrap care in another classroom, or maybe the team would tell me it'd be better to leave the same kids in the same classroom all day, and we'd flip the staff members. Then that could be an option for us, too, but, but as it long would as, be in a classroom space. And yeah. as long as you have enough who are enrolled in the full day with the wraparound care, you can allocate between morning and afternoon, right, to spread out right, kids. Like, balance. if they're there the whole day, you can, so it's not ever, you know, 30 kids in right, one class and 10 in the other. Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm sure we'll have to work through the parent preference portion of that, but yeah, we would work through that piece. That actually made me think of um, one other thing, and I don't remember the ratios. For um, wraparound care for fourth for fourth graders, for four-year-olds, is it also just one, what's the ratio of instructor to student? I don't know the exact ratio. I mean, would it have to be more than one? I would for wraparound one staff member. I mean for the, like yeah for the yeah there'd be more yeah. than one adult okay. yeah um but then the other question I had and it's not related to what Laura was just talking about but it did spark something when you were talking about the facilities I know that one of the rationales that you that you had for moving kids and I totally agree into middle school sixth graders into a middle school experience rather than just seventh and eighth graders in junior high was because of the disparity between kindergarten and sixth grade. You see where I'm going with this. <laughs> I mean, now you've got the same disparity, but with a year younger. And if I remember right, also, because I know that um, it's legal for four-year-olds to be on buses. Is that is that the way that the transportation would work? Would they also be potentially with fifth graders? I mean, is this like yeah, a group? Yeah, potentially they'd right. be on those, those so, routes with fifth graders. So, yeah. And I wouldn't say that one of our most compelling reasons, I'd probably no, I mean, disagree with you there a little bit, would be the disparity. I think it was more the similarity probably for sixth graders to seventh and eighth graders oh. and the need for, you know, um, a different academic experience, different opportunities and what the elementary provides. I don't think we necessarily sure. approached it as there was a concern uh, with the kindergarten and sixth graders being in the same building. Yeah. It's worked a long time for us. So I think that yeah. disparity we're Fair. used to in the age gap and doing that, I think it was really more of a uh, making sure our sixth graders got the best opportunity availed to them. Fair point. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, talk to the, the comment that uh, Councillor Thomas made. I would be really interested in the school-based uh, breakdown of this, um, if not just for Iowa City, the entire proposal. Um, I think being able to see things uh, from a top-down geographic perspective can do a lot to give us um, more insight to where we have uh, people with great access, where we have people with less access, uh, and could also point to other systemic issues that might need addressing to, to lower those barriers. So um, if at some point you guys get that information, I'd, I'd really like to see that. Yep, we'll make a note of that. I agree with that, too, um, because we've, we've been hearing forever the disparity in the uh, or discrepancy between the free and reduced lunch at the various schools, how some have way more than the others. So I think that that really could make a difference as far as how many of the kids would qualify and how many would be at that school then. Out of curiosity for the age of, uh, will this work in kind of the same formula as kindergarten depending on when that, for, for kids whose birthday maybe fall in late August, September, October, where they turn four sort of halfway through the school year, would they be eligible when they turn four, or would it be sort of like the year before they would start kindergarten? Would that be, do you, does that question make sense? Yeah, you're basically asking, you know, is the start date now just, one, is it clean, is it one year earlier? And I believe it's the same yes. birth date, yeah, okay. yeah. So it'd just be four-year-old by the same date that we would normally look at for five-year-olds, yeah. 
And I would say, you know, I mean, we'll definitely get that data, but just the other thought, I mean, you can kind of project it on your head. You're probably pretty familiar with our district demographics about where we have more economically depressed areas in the district than we have other ones. And the likelihood is that of those 280 students that we're not missing, right, it's going to line up or, or line over, you know, where we would see those trends too. But that is a good follow-up, and we'll definitely have the team do that. Yeah, I was kind of prompted by just seeing, you know, what Hills was like five people. <laughs> I thought, wow, I mean, that you could picture the people. Uh, you know, 280, it's kind of just the mass. Yeah. So I, I thought yeah. breaking it down makes it much more real for me. Yeah, exactly. May I ask a couple questions? Yeah. I uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding some of the math correct. So if you go back to the a couple of slides, Matt, to... Uh, to the, I guess it's the fourth slide overall. Or if you can't see the numbers, it's the... Yeah. This first table? It's got the one on the top left there. Okay, yeah, that one. Um, so I understand the 280 comes from the previous slide. If I understand it right, the 280 is the number in the current kindergarten class that did not report a preschool. Yeah. Okay, so if you go back to that, the, the next slide, um, your um, the top two bullets there are your current preschool connections, the 475 that are in your district now, and then the 114 that are being served with, with your community partner agencies. Looking at your kindergarten enrollment this year, so we're kind of talking two different populations, I understand that, but you've got uh, over a 1,000 kindergarten students this year, and it looks like you're only serving between those top two bullets, about 600. So is there a difference, is, is there a, a pretty big difference in enrollment, or I'm missing where that 280 gap is? Yeah, so the 280 gap really goes to this desired state of where we think we could get to that full enrollment of 840, about what we could serve. Um, that's on this, it's in the top right corner there to yeah. talk about kind of conservative enrollment, and then where we would see full enrollment fill in at. And so that's then building off of this, um, oh, now I'm off the 475 to try to grow that up. We don't, again, assume we would capture everybody, but between those community partners and based on growing the student, knowing that we're missing, you know, roughly 300 students there, that we're going to be close to that desired state of the 800. And that would just kind of build out maxing maxing those rooms. So again, the intention is to try to grab the students with no preschool, but we're also assuming that other parents, once they do find out about this, are probably going to want to send their kid to the same school as their sibling. And so there's some increase accounted for in that way to probably just beyond the 280 when we look okay. at building that model. Does that make sense? Jeff? I, I think I'm following. Maybe I don't understand. What is the what is a community partner agency that's affiliated? So that means they would serve those preschool students at their site, but they work with us for curriculum, planning, okay. progression of lessons. So that's different than a private provider. Right. Right. It's well, a, it, it's a private provider that, that partners you, with us. Yeah. Gotcha. But there's private providers that you don't directly partner Yeah, there's with. Some other ones that we have no relationship with. Okay. Right. Thank you for helping me with that. Yeah. Um, the, the other question I had um, is, is more f for me just kind of thinking about how this would be funded. Um, th the expected cost escalation of, of a municipal contribution per year. I understand maybe you mentioned locking in funding for, for two or three years, uh, which would be of great help, but we know that fourth year would come and there would be an escalator there, and we've got to make sure I understand what that would be. It looks like it's a very labor transportation type of investment, so um, I don't know what you're seeing with your, your current labor and transportation, but is 5 6% annually pretty accurate? or? Is that a little high or low based on what you're well, seeing? We haven't, we haven't factored that in, and I think part of that would be wanting to work with you guys on what that would look like, right? We have a need that we know to get it off the ground, but I think, you know, in, you know, in a collaborative spirit, we'd want to say, okay, well, we don't want to propose a number that's probably not sustainable or something you couldn't factor into your budget after that period of time where it's a big shock to the system and a new dollar amount, but that is also, you know, reflective of what increased costs we have. So I think that would be something we would anticipate probably working with you directly on to say, okay, what does make sense? What kind of an agreement could we come to about what that looks like? And maybe rather than a locked rate, it would it would make more sense over on a yearly basis, right, to keep up with those costs too. I don't know what that looks like because um, that can be less of a shock to the system than if there's an incremental increase each year too. 
So open to any of those conversations, I would say, on our end. On this slide, is the unincorporated, is that represent, would that be represented or covered by the county? So that's really all they would be in for? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any final questions or thoughts? This has been, thank you so much for this time. It's thank been you very in depth, and we really appreciate it. Your questions appreciate are it. helpful to us, too, as we continue planning on it. So, thank you. I am going to end um, I, to go back to your question about the other municipality feedback that we got. Um, the Daily Iowan wrote a very nice article about the meeting with the Board of Supervisors, and, and some of the supervisors expressed support from the um, discussion table. They also expressed a commitment to have an up or down vote by March 15th. So we expect to have some guidance from the Johnson County Board of Supervisors within the next month. Um, and so I would just say, you know, stay tuned. That that, that should answer um, your question on that about what they're, they're thinking of. And then when we presented to North Liberty last week, we did ask for them <clears throat> to make a up or down decision by April 1st. Uh, we understand the county meets more frequently than than the municipality bodies. Um, but uh, my understanding is that North Liberty do, did think that April 1st would be a realistic, um, not to have the, everything in place, but for the have the municipality make a decision about, yes, we do want to go forward with figuring out how to get this done. And so we would hope to have, um, to continue to have the municipalities um, march forward, uh, again, with just making a decision of, of whether or not this is a commitment that we want to commit to hopefully by April 1st, April 15th would be the time frame that we would ask. Can I ask, so, um, and it goes back to sort of a suggestion slash question about working with the local child care provider community and those who um, have been working on this for, for years to, is this like what you've provided with us? Is that basically the plan moving forward or is there room and time to be able to make adjustments based on feedback from people who've been doing this for a while as well. Sure. Well, again, what Matt said is we have been collaborating with them. Um, the Child Care Solutions Group got the same PowerPoint presentation that Joint Entities did, and we've been working with yeah. Lynette Jacoby at the county, and she's um, she came to the county presentation as well. And, and we are certainly continuing to collaborate with them. The decision that we're asking to be made is not to have detail, every single detail right. in place. And because of that, that provides the flexibility to be adaptable and to continue to work and, and form a plan right, that's, um, of what the final version looks like. Yeah, that's where I was going yeah. with that. Yep. And if uh, the council were to make a determination on that bigger picture by April 1st or April 15th, operationally, remind us when you expect to begin? So we would begin the 24-25 school year. So not next year but the year after that. And that's why we have so much time. Once we decide if we're going to move forward, why we have so much time to, to hammer out those details and, and make sure that we're gonna stand up the best system that we can. We obviously haven't mentioned lost once. <laughs> and Thank that you. was the focus at joint entities. Um, if you all decided that you did want to commit to this and you lost as a source of funding, that per than some additional time constraints. But frankly, the school district isn't wed to the how you all decide to fund this program and, and where you find that money. I just think it's always a terrible idea to come to municipalities and say, hey, can we please have $1.6 million and then not have a way to to um, have an idea about how to generate that revenue. Um, and that's what Lost was, right? Is a way to say, and if you're worried about how you're going to fund it, here is one way to fund your portion of that. But if you all feel comfortable finding different sources of revenue to support the contribution that we're asking, uh, that's certainly, you know, we're not gonna tell you how to spend your money or how to raise it. That's totally within your purview. Um, but we did want to be very clear about what that funding contribution looks like um, going forward. Um, but if you can do it at a source that's other than lost, then that, um, that removes that time constraint of the um, November election. 
Yeah. I, just to clarify then, the what decisions is the district needing to make, or what's your time frame if you hear from us by, by then? If you're willing to say, yes, we are going to um, support this program with a financial contribution, we may not. So, and, and one of the things about this chart, right, is there are really three different budgetary methods. And while all of them equal 1.6 at the end of the day, and the district isn't really wed to a certain one. That's for the municipalities to agree on. If everyone does agree to support the program, the municipalities would all have to agree on the same, the same budget process. Um, but that's not even something that would have to be decided by April 1st. What, what we're asking for is a decision saying, yes, we believe in preschool. We believe in the transformational um, opportunity that this presents for our community, and we are willing to financially support it using one of these three models. Let's all get together now, those of us who have made this commitment, and figure out how it is going to work. If you backward plan it, we basically right. need to be out at this time next year promoting mm -hmm. that we're going to do this in the fall, because that's what we're doing right now with yeah. current preschool sites, right? So we really have that time period in between to figure out all of these logistical pieces. Thank you. Great. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all so much for uh, giving us time. I know it's budget season and how busy you all are, and so we really do appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and talk to you all about this. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Um, our next item is the discussion of aid to agency legacy agency spending recommendations. Madam Acting Mayor, I believe we do need a motion to accept correspondence. Oh, yes. A uh, motion to accept correspondence. So moved. Second. Second. Oh. Uh, second uh, sorry. Motion by uh, Dunn and second by Harmson. Harmson. <laughs> I'm losing last names. Uh, voice voice is appropriate for that. Oh. And I do it? Yes. Okay. Uh, done. Aye. Oh, oh you can say all those in favor. Oh, say right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank That's you. That's right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Nay? Okay. So, um, are you ready to start with the next item? <clears throat> Yep. Uh, so next uh, item, I will probably have something to do with the Center for Worker Justice. Um, as I am a community organizer and employed by them, I will be stepping out and recusing for this conversation and any future conversations surrounding them or funding. Okay. Thank you. So uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council, I just wanted to uh, point your attention, the public's attention to the uh, packet on the um, 16th. Um, so last week, uh, IP4 uh, staff provided you some background uh, on the aid to agencies program, a little bit of history there, and a little bit about where we're at in the current process. Uh, tried to frame a little bit at the very end of that memo for uh, how your discussion could go today. I don't plan to walk you through that, but um, uh, we have staff here that uh, are very experienced with this program and uh, can answer questions uh, as needed. Thank you very much. Um, and I think for council, if you are comfortable with this, given that um, the decision to approve recommendations or not is not going to be before us until later in the spring. I would prefer, uh, it seems to make most sense for us to look at the memo and to consider um, staff's recommendations for potential action items that, that we have. Um, rather than to get into the specifics of um, agency uh, dollar amounts and recommendations, if that is acceptable. That, that sounds like a good plan. Um, I just wanted to point out that um, the final bullet point on page six of the report did state that if the council is uncomfortable with the criteria used uh, to form a recommendation that we should advise the HCDC of that, and, and I just wanted to make it clear that I was very uncomfortable yes. with, with how that all fell out. And I, however, we need to do that then uh, to follow through on that. I think, so be it. And I think that that fits within the sort of the way I was envisioning this, not that I am the sole purveyor of this at all, but um, that this isn't dealing with recommendations about money, but rather the way in which, um, you know, as staff noted, um, the way that the, the decisions were 
um, arrived at. So um, I will open this up and see if there are other comments or thoughts from council. Sure. Well, I would I would certainly agree with Councillor Taylor on that last bullet item that um, yeah we we need to revisit that. Um, th there was a good faith effort there on the part of um, CWJ and Community and Family Resources and. Uh, you know, this is some computer, computer issues on the other end, but let's let's set that aside. Yeah, I agree that the um, uh, you know the uh, uh, using that particular piece of the criteria, the late um, the late submission because it was due to a computer error, not on the fault of the people submitting, but on the um, just to something that happened on the agency that was handling that on our behalf. Um, that certainly doesn't seem fair to um, deny funding based on something that was out of the hands of the applicant. Um, I also have noticed, too, the difference in the, uh, for, for at least one of the agencies that we're talking about, uh, from November to this last meeting, there was a $15,000 switch, right, from yes to no. Um, and clearly, because of that one criteria, um, as I understand it, too, we won't be looking at the final recommendations until April, May, something like that. Um, so realizing that then there's that question about that funding, that 15000 So I think maybe it would be uh, wise to have that set aside, and we could decide that at that time um, so that that doesn't become reallocated somewhere else or go to something, something different. Um, and then we can make that decision uh, as a council at that point in time rather than stepping into the process at this point in time and, and making a, a final decision on that. Yeah, I think from a process standpoint, it might be most helpful just to give that direction to HCDC before we have the final recommendation. And I think um, my understanding is that the the late submissions was kind of maybe added later as a, a, a reason or maybe rose to the top in the discussion when staff wasn't recommending that that was the reason why they weren't uh, accepted. Right. So I think we can make, if we all agree with that, we can make clear to HCDC that that shouldn't be the criteria. If there are other criteria, tell us, you know, explain yourselves. Um, but that I, I think I, you know, I'm not really comfortable kind of like reallocating the categories, for example, at this point, just to you know, to say like the percentages should change based on this one concern, I think we can handle it by saying, okay, that's not a reason to deny funding to an agency, so go forward from there and see what we get in May. Well, I certainly agree with all here. Um, it, it seems to me to deny uh, potential funding based on a technicality really does not kind of I'm staring at the circle of our values I just don't think that that's really serving the community or the um, the agencies who are trying to serve the community so um, I would definitely prefer for HCDC to go back and look at these applications again and discount um, the lateness as a reason um, it, it that just doesn't seem to be in the spirit of how these funds are supposed to be allocated and who they're serving. I would additionally say that um, I, I had been on HCDC, and I know it, this is a you know it's a commission that takes its charge very seriously, and there's a lot that goes into it. Um, so I definitely thank them for their work, but I I do think that in this case it. This is an instance where I think looking at the criteria and, and what the legacy agencies are doing um, is, is something that is warranted here rather than technicalities. So are we in agreement to direct or to, to ask, advise HCDC to um, set aside the technicality? the criteria of um, lateness and to be able to go back and potentially adjust final recommendations. 
So that would be, I uh, just want to make sure we, we get your expectations correct. We would ask HCDC to, um, I don't want to say reopen, but uh, uh, look at the legacy agency allocation again with that understanding that a, a technical late submission from those two organizations uh, in and of itself would not be a reason to disqualify. Ask them to take another vote on the legacy agency allocation and then they obviously have to vote on the emerging still. That'll take place March 30th, and then it comes back to you. Is that that what I'm hearing? I would even potentially just want to throw out there again of going that but one step further. Since we actually do have, from the November 15th minutes, we do have a decision uh, for one agency of 15,000 that then disappeared by the January meeting, and, and that, I think, just if not reinst reinstating that now, making sure that gets set aside and not reallocated somewhere else because clearly the intention at, in November was to allocate that funding for that agency and that intention changed. And both of those votes were one vote off. I forget if they were 4-3 or 4-5. So, so HCDC apparently is also grappling with this, but I think still the, impl the, the intention of, of one case the majority and one case a bare minority was to fund this agency. And so, um, you know, my concern is if we just say, just go back and redo your work, that at that point then we might end up with kind of back in the same place. Um, and since we already, you know, have, have kind of watched that sort of seesaw back and forth, you know, again, my fear is we're going to end up back in this, having the same discussion here in, in a month. So. As so opposed to just setting it aside and then just dealing with it as a council. So that's the second. There's the language here in our memo. Leave, leave a set amount of remaining funds unallocated for city council assignment. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm getting at. So. Mm -hmm. I think if we're not reviewing the applications, I'm not comfortable making that determination at the end of the process. I mean, I, I, if we're going to kind of like usurp HCDC's recommendation, I would want us to have some reason for that other than there was a point in time when when it changed. And I think from my understanding of the the discussion, this technicality was sort of the one of the reasons why it changed. And if we say remove that, you know, it, they may go back to where they were. So, I, I mean... But I, I just wouldn't be comfortable saying we're going to set it aside and then we'll decide at the end of the process where that money goes without us evaluating the applications or even knowing this, you know, the really the strength and relativity of all of that. I, I'm not willing to do that. So, I do understand where both of these sides. And one of the things actually, as I was going through and read the memo, that struck me, and there was. Um, Several and it, some of this was in the memo, and then there was some that was in the I think the resolution itself. But um, repeatedly, staff noted the program is intended to be a stable funding source for eligible agencies with a minimum of fifteen thousand dollars. Up to five percent of the total budget, et cetera, can be um, reserved for the emerging ADA requests. Um, it, it seems to me and I didn't note it elsewhere, but it is in the memo as well as in the resolution, that the, the legacy agencies have a certain expectation of stable funding. So I guess in addition to encouraging HCDC to discount or to ask them to discount the technicalities, it's also to look at what the resolution says and what the expectation by legacy agencies may be um, about what funding they may receive. Um, I think that stability portion is important, I, and yet I do agree with you, for Laura, for us to simply go and look at one application, or potentially all of them, is taking away from the work that HCDC has been doing deeply, um, and that they've been commissioned to do. So, I guess my, I get that. I think my part, of, part of it, though, is too, is that that no issues have been raised one way or the other with any of the other applications. So, well, on, on one hand, I, I take very, um, I, I take uh, seriously the uh, idea that we don't want to go in and micromanage. Um, I would point out that uh, talking about uh, this this one application um, or, or this one issue only affects a very small percentage of the whole body of recommendations coming from the HCDC on this funding. So, you know, if we were going through, I, I would feel, 
I would probably agree even more with Councillor Burgess's point about feeling like we were micromanaging if we were going in there and just monkeying with everything that they did, as opposed to having one thing that sort of had a little bit of a red flag that, that looked like it was probably, you know, the, kind of our role to have that oversight and to be the final arbiters of are we hitting all of our community values that we want to do and doing what's best for the community in general. So that's kind of where I'm coming from with that. Um, I think it's probably a probably good opportunity for me to say that um, I have a great deal of gratitude for the work that HCDC does going through all of these, um, you know, going back through the history uh, that, that uh, um, to kind of put this whole process into place. And so I do have a great deal of appreciation um, and gratitude for the work that has been done. But that in and of itself doesn't mean that if I see something that looks like it's a mistake that I'm not going to step in and, and you know, say that's a kind of, you know, what I was elected to do, kind of, and that's what we all were elected to do, sort of that final stop on the, on the process to make sure, even with the best process in the world, if it looks like it's going to have a mistake that we are here to try and correct that error. And I think that's kind of what I'm getting at with that and trying to make sure that we fully correct the error. We could just send this back with direction of don't use this, this we don't think this is a fair criteria to use. That's one way to do it. I would be more comfortable, even like I said, t going a little bit step further and with the recommendation, uh, the one possible recommendation of setting aside that 15,000. Um, so I would, that would be my first preference. My second preference would be the, oops. <laughs> my second preference would be the other option of, uh, that, that Councilor Burgess was talking about, so. Clarify for me then, um, Councilor Harmson, setting aside that 15,000 and, and going back to what uh, Councilor Burgess said, you're not meaning that that was going to be for the council then to decide. You're wanting it to go back to HCDC to decide that fifteen thousand. Well, just that, clarify. That, just clarify that. That is actually what we're. That is okay. the, that is the exactly point of, yeah. of, okay. of disagreement. Yeah, is, that's is right. where we think that should go back to. So my my thing is just set it aside, okay. move it out of the council. process, and then right. And that's what I was confused about. Which sure. Yeah. And, and I think Councilor Burgess was was we both we we all agree that. The late thing because it was a technical glitch right, on, right. on our end, not their end. So we're all on the same page there. It's like, what do we do with that then? I think we should leave it to be a council decision later just for that little little part of it. Councilor Burgess thinks we should just send it back to HCDC to take care of. So I think that's, that's probably, is that a fair summary of mm -hmm. just a, where we're just on slightly different if the, for maybe for staff, if the 15,000 is not set aside and the final recommendation comes to us in May, how hard or easy would it be to, at that point in time, say, no, we think the 15,000 should go to a different place? Like, is it allocated proportionately that it would be simple to back it out and rather than setting it aside? What's the functional difference at that meeting in May if that money has been set aside or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm following. But if, if the money is set aside, then what we're going to do before they vote on their emerging agency dollars, we're going to say, instead of thirty-seven thousand for you to spend on emerging agencies, you have twenty-two thousand to spend on emerging agencies, and then council, you'll have fifteen to plug wherever you want uh, within the aid agencies process. Now, keep in mind, you've got a resolution that calls for a. 95-5 split, but you can have you, you have some flexibility there. Um, so it's really a matter of do you want that decision um, on where to invest that 15, uh, or do you want them to make a recommendation to you? At the end of the day, it's your decision. You have to agree with their recommendations or, or change them. But do you want them to make that early recommendation, or do you want us to basically pull that money out of the emerging pot that they're prepping for now? Well, I, yeah, I, I would like to honor the work of HCDC, but at the same time, I think that one particular item of the 15,000 could be set aside uh, for the council to make the call at, at the appropriate time at the final award stage. Would we not have any recommendation for where that money's going at that time? Is that kind of what I'm understanding then? Well, you, you still have the HCDC scoring and the staff scoring of all the applications. That's the legacy agency applications. Um, I need some help here from Erica or Tracy. Do we score emerging? Um, okay, so we don't we don't score the emerging. So 
in terms of recommendations to you, you can only probably rely on the application scores. And we put the HCDC score in here. We didn't put the staff score in there, but that's something we would convey uh, in, in May or whenever the HUD allocation is provided. At this point, are we, because obviously this isn't an action item on the agenda, that there would be a vote. Is staff looking for a certain number of people to nod their heads in a certain pathway? Uh, what, <laughs> but, you know, in terms of yeah, uh, I, how, do, how do we move forward? I, yeah. yeah, I think I think a majority of council will need to give us direction to relay to HCDC. And especially since we're down two council members. For, <laughs> correct. So at this point, I, I yeah. fully understand one, the first communication is that the, the, the lateness of the submission uh, should not be the sole determining factor or a, a factor mm -hmm. in, in your decision making. Uh, I think the, the, the question is, do you want to go beyond that and, and say to remove the 15 or leave 15 unallocated for for your final decision or do you want them to say okay we understand that we'll take that into consideration and either rescore legacy or invest that in emerging or you know they've got a whole set of options that they could look at the thing I would add uh, too is that it would be helpful to HCDC to kind of understand, um, you know, what it is that you would like to see them do differently. Now, of course, we already just talked about the don't consider a late application as disqualifying. Okay, great. That'll be easy. That's clear. We can pass that on. But the other part about setting aside fifteen thousand dollars, I mean, I'm a little unclear as to what we would tell HCDC about that. That is that. Uh, I assume it's not because they changed their mind on anything between uh, the November meeting and the subsequent meeting and so forth, but is there any additional message you would want to pass on to HCDC about that so that they can make sure that they are acting consistent with your wishes in the future? I mean, I think this is where I sit, unfortunately, directly in the middle and mm -hmm. on the fence. Um, is because I think that the agencies that we're talking about that um, we would have that money set aside are doing great good. On the other side of it, though, I don't believe it's council's role, per se, although oversight is absolutely there. But this is essentially not saying oversight. It's saying we're taking this amount of money to give to this agency regardless of what you think. And and that's the part that puts me very much in an uncomfortable area because it's not about like well I mean that is the message essentially if we were to set aside fifteen thousand dollars right it is so that we can fund an agency um, a very specific you know it would be CWJ and and I think that the work that they do is tremendous and I think they are a legacy agency and I would like to have um, HCDC do everything possible to look at the totality of this but I personally am not comfortable ensuring that for CWJ because they have gone through the same process as the other legacy agencies and HCDC and staff it, it, it isn't necessarily settled because they had two different um, one was kind of a penciled in vote and one was the the actual recommendation um so i'm not comfortable taking that control out of their hands as much as i support the entities of all of the legacy agencies um for what it's worth i when i was on it and i know that it all depends and it changes um i would uh, actually operated on the assumption as an hcdc member that legacy agencies all got something so um this is an uncomfortable thing to to set aside money because it's very clearly earmarked for one agency and that does essentially take control out of the process that has been put in place and while it's only one agency i'm uncomfortable with that is there some way that we can work with the hcdc and find out what other criteria they based this on besides the late well, I mean, application? I mean, there are the minutes in the, in the video of the meeting. And right. so what changed from the 15th the, to the, exactly. from, from November to, was clearly in the meeting minutes and it right. was the late. Yeah, it was I mean, clearly there, just there the was late. Nothing, so. 
I mean, that was that was the that was the reason. I mean, again, on the exactly. earlier meeting, they, right. the funding was there, and then it was taken away, and the discussion was very very focused on the mm -hmm. on the the what twelve minutes late because of a technical glitch on and our end. It just doesn't seem like it should carry that much weight. But it's my yeah. Opinion. So, and that's why I feel comfortable saying, okay, look at this again. Don't consider that as a factor and tell us what your recommendation is. And then we'll decide. And Megan, I really appreciate your comments and totally agree. This should not be about, you know, making judgments about one agency's work or not, or, you know, that, that I think we really are here to talk about the process. And my inability to answer Eric's question of what direction would we give to HCDC to do differently other than don't consider the technicality is what kind of puts me solidly like, I don't want to set aside that money. So I think so there's John two. and I are sort of on the same mm -hmm. place still. I guess, Pauline, where, where are you with? Just really hadn't considered that 15,000 and, and what I would want them to do or not do about it. I have concerns that if it does come down to the final decision made by them and they weigh against this organization again, um, if you have set aside that 15,000, but it, it's, it's tough <laughs> um, because I, I I also think that this the CW, I'll just go ahead and say it, the CWJ is, is an excellent organization. They've done a lot of good work. We've helped them out a lot over the years. Um, but I'm sure there, there are other agencies out there that would say, well, you always give them the money, you know. Why, why are you always giving them the money? And I don't want agencies to think that. Um, but I, I, it's just that whole... <laughs> Well, I, I'm not. I, I, yeah, do you look ahead. at the the memo? It, it doesn't obligate us to, right. to award it to anyone. It states right. that uh, it's unallocated, and it's for city council assignment to either legacy or emergent agencies at the final award stage. So there's a, there's a choice involved there. It's not the the outcome isn't predetermined. Is my reading on that? Okay. Well, then well I would go what along with criteria that. will we use to make that determination at that time? would be an evaluation of, you know, the circumstances behind the decision. Which we'll be making whether we set aside the money or not, <laughs> right? Well. I just don't want us to be stuck having to allocate that money. Like, we're going to have to decide what the criteria are at that time if we don't have a recommendation for where it's going to go. Well, I'm okay with, I, I view this as a, a, a very small amount of the overall amount, and you know, I, I do feel I want, given the circumstances of how we, we've landed at this point, have some control over the outcome. Which is, that's what our vote in May is, right? Right. So are you... But no, no, I'm st I'm, st I'm kind of. No, no, I was I, looking at Pauline. Oh, you're yeah, looking at yeah. Pauline. Sorry, <laughs> that's really what I mean. Like, no, I I'm agreeing with with that. The um, although I don't think we, I agree with Laura that we as a council shouldn't be again back to my argument. We shouldn't be put in the position of saying, "Oh, okay, well, we've got this fifteen thousand dollars. We're going to give it all to this group because they were faulted by the HCDC in the first round." Uh, I don't think that's fair, but uh, again, in that bullet point about it, uh, advising HCDC, it said uh, providing them an opportunity to adjust their final recommendations. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, I think I, that's what I would like them to hear from us is that you need to adjust this uh, and look at it again and uh, not base it solely on the late application. And so they would still have the 15,000. According to that, it sounds like they would still have the 15,000 mm -hmm. in their pot. And hopefully they will see the, uh, the worthiness of CWJ to, to receive these funds uh, and that they perhaps were errant in their decision to base it on the lateness. So uh, yeah. 
so I would, that's what I would say. So your recommendation yeah. is to send it back to HD, HCDC for them to adjust for their right to 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 relook at this and and uh, to kind of dig into their deep into their souls and say, oh, were we influenced by this one person, this one commission member who said, oh, well, we gotta just you know forget them because they were late. Uh, they've got to really dig deep and see why they initially, as Sean keeps pointing out, voted to give this money to them. Um, yeah, so that's what I would say, and yeah. Okay, so if I, if I understand the majority here, we're gonna ask the HCDC to not consider the technical late submission uh, against either of the two agencies, and we'll ask them to essentially reopen both the legacy and the um, emerging agencies vote. Where they decide to allocate those funds is their call. You ultimately can adjust those at the end of the day, um, but uh, we'll have them, we'll intentionally have them vote on the legacy agency funding again to give them that opportunity to change what they have already recommended. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item three, uh, clarification of agenda items. One, one second. Oh, I'm we'll sorry, we Councilor needed to call Dunn back. Again. Councilor Dunn, my bad. Welcome back. All right, do we have clarification of agenda items? Um, information packet, February 9th, uh, we need to make sure that we have council direction on uh, IP2 memo from the city manager, the strategic plan presentations to boards and commissions, which I think is an so awesome idea. I, I just uh, wanted to share this thought with you. It's, it's certainly optional, but as you have adopted your strategic plan, your staff is working hard to uh, make sure that your 600 plus staff members are well aware of that plan and, and are carrying out those values. Mm -hmm. Uh, we think it would be a good idea or a good opportunity for you to uh, take some time over the next several months to visit your, your boards and commissions and also present them with an overview of the strategic plan. Also gives you a good opportunity to get in front of them and just say thank you for, for their service uh, on those. So um, staff has already prepared kind of canned presentations. It wouldn't take a whole lot of prep, but it would take your uh, time to um, review those materials and and uh, appear before those boards and commissions. So I think uh, it would work if each of you would volunteer to take two, or if some wanted to do more than that and others less, that's fine. Um, but in the memo, we've listed out the boards and commissions there, mm -hmm. and uh, either here or we can do it offline via email. Um, we can all, if you would all sign up for, for a couple of them, uh, staff would work with you to schedule one at a convenient time. I think it's a fantastic idea. Mm -hmm. It gives us a chance to get to know the commission as well. And yeah. and I have no preference. I'll be happy to go to any of them. So if somebody else has a strong preference, I will. I would too, but I'd like to do CPRB and TRC. If nobody cares. <laughs> TRC uh, and what? Uh, CPRB, Community Police Review. Since I go to their meetings anyway, I right. figure that yeah. makes sense. I'd be particularly interested in climate action in the senior center. Well, I'll uh, throw my hat on the um, historic preservation and planning and zoning. Are, were you asking one or two, can two of us go to... Uh, multiple, you, yeah, I mean, I think okay. if you want uh, to, to go in pairs, that's fine, but on average, I think we need everybody to, to cover two. Because I would also be interested in, in the Senior Senate Commission and perhaps um, the library. I'd be interested in going to planning and zoning as well, if that's an option. Can I make sure that we get them all covered first and then we can double? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm happy to do um, Parks and Rec. Um, I can do any of the others, just plug me in. But that would be one that would be nice. I'm happy to do more than two also. 
Well, you know the, the penalty. Say no more than four <laughs> or five. <laughs> and you know the penalty for missing a meeting is you get assigned things, so Bruce is out of luck. <laughs> there we, oh, that's right. We forgot about Bruce. Oh, shoot. Yeah. The mayor. Hmm. There we go. Well, there, there are 14 boards or commissions listed and seven when full of staff of you, and that's why Jeff yeah. is saying yeah. two each. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> So I guess we can kind of see where it all falls out and yeah, see what's I'll follow up via email with a list, Great. and yeah. we'll we won't. You're just gonna put the mayor's name in all, all the rest yeah. of them, correct? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Um, are there other items on uh, info packet February 9th? I just want to note that the uh, memo from the city engineer was incredibly helpful, uh, kind of giving the whole history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of um, the different possibilities, um, as well as actually sort of why the eventual solution that's recommended is the one that is going to go forward and how, you know, the, the actual neighborhood enhancements that it offers as well. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Yeah, I'd like to thank staff on that as well. And I, I won't be able to attend the next meeting when, where I think this comes to us. So I, I will mention a, a couple of things. Uh, you know, I think all of you can guess that I would certainly, in principle, support the idea of narrowing the roadway. Um, at the same time, I am a very much a case-by-case -case person. You know, I feel, you know, every circumstance may have its own reasons. Um, but in looking at this, it, it does seem like it would be beneficial. I would, I would also note that uh, TEG on the other side of the park is 36 feet wide, which is the, the width of the uh, Abbey Lane. And there are traffic calming um, humps on TEG. So I mean, the notion that a wider street can result in higher speeds, I think, seems to that's that's one example uh, of a street in the same neighborhood where at the same um, street width that has the traffic calming features um, the other thing uh, was one other comment i would make was on the it's widening the parkway width from mm -hmm. and uh, the staff i don't think talked about what it the existing width is you know based on um you know, Johnson County GIS, it looks like it's 10 feet wide. And so I went out and took a measurement of our parkway width on my street of Brown Street, and it's 16 feet wide. And it's a, I, I think it would be beneficial to widen from 10 feet. There's, mm -hmm. it's a, that's a considerable improvement from 10 to 14. A lot more you can do in that space. Uh, so, that and, and I don't know if staff has any, I, I guess in advance of the meeting, any understanding of what some of the traffic related issues are. You know, what, what are, do we have an, a sense of what the speeds are on Abbey Lane or traffic counts? Um, I, I'm guessing no, just because, the, it, because it's not a through street, I have to imagine it's pretty low and probably hasn't necessitated any review. But Yeah, I, I'd have to go back and look, but my guess is no, we yeah. wouldn't have that information. Or, or parking, the amount of parking. I know, part of this was just seeing some of the public comment, you know, that we're getting a lot of parking for use of Kiwanis, and if there's any verification on what, what we're seeing out there in terms of parking. Yeah, I'm guessing everybody has their own version of kind of what they've seen out there, but I, I think what we've seen and what we've heard is probably that parking is more of an issue during the summer months. So right now, probably not nearly as much of an issue, but um, I think even the comments we've received from the public have been focused on those times where park activity is, is high. Because mm -hmm. it, yeah, it seems, I can't imagine, it seems to me that TAG is really the front door of the park too. Uh, rather than the Abbey Lane side. Um, I think it is something to think. What, the one issue that came to mind was where uh, Abbey Lane terminates, you know, at the park. So at 36 feet going to 28, what might happen there? You know, it's, it's not going to be as wide as it is now. It's, it's not a, it's a cul-de-sac without a, a bulb, basically. And whether having it at 28 feet, um, poses any problems, I think it would just be something that could be assessed 
Yeah, and I'd have to go back and check, but I believe we were looking at having it remain full width right at the park. Um, there's actually some stormwater intakes right there at oh, the, so the entrance that would we were planning to leave in place. So there will be a transition from 28, I believe, to the 36 right at the end of okay. the block. Okay, well, then that answers my question. Um, so there is an adjustment at the end point. Good. So those are some of my observations. Um, we do, I just want to mention uh, in the same packet, um, congratulations to the Climate Action Coordinator and the Energy Efficiency Grant Program for insulation. Um, it seems like it's a really great program and it's wonderful to see that it's going to be continued on with uh, heat pumps as well. So That's awesome. I think this is really fantastic. This is about what climate action looks like in practice. Mm -hmm. So kudos to staff and for those efforts. So if I may jump a little bit, I know that we have our February 16th uh, packet, but we also have USG here, and I believe we can probably squeeze in their status updates before we break for formal. Is that all right with everyone? Mm -hmm. And we'll go back to the 16th. And then we'll, Wait, yes, yeah. and, then we'll the and then we'll return to the 16th after the meeting, after the formal. We'll break for formal. Okay. I'm sorry. And then finish the packet. That's okay. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, Council. We just have a few brief announcements here. Uh, first off, USG is passing legislation tonight in support of the SEIU uh, 119 union, which is compromise of healthcare workers at the University of Iowa Healthcare. Uh, they have been involved in ongoing negotiations with the Board of Regents, and as of Sunday, February 5th, the boards um, uh, offered their initial proposal and then canceled all future bargaining meeting meetings. Uh, UI Cogs is involved in ongoing negotiations with the Board of Regents, and just recently, uh, Cogs gave a presentation to them. Uh, Cogs is wanting a 10% uh, raise, while Board of Regents is currently going for 3%. The negotiations are continuing, and the final closed session meeting is set for the 27th. Uh, the University of Iowa is also planning on selling the Mayflower Residency Hall. Um, by the spring of 2024, the university then is planning to build a new east side dorm closer to campus. Thank you. Thank you. And, I you. and thank you again for having us mm -hmm. two weeks ago. That was a great experience. It's really fun. From the 16th that I wanted to talk about. Okay. Well, we haven't gotten to the 16th yet. What? We haven't gotten to the 16th yet. That's what I'm saying. You're going to do that after. Yes. After the regular meeting. Yeah. All right. Um, it is 546, and so we will adjourn until we 6 We will recess. We will recess. <laughs> Thank you. We will recess until 6 p.m. We will take back up with the formal meeting. All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're reconvening the work session now, and we're going to continue with um, it's item four, the info packet discussion for February 16th. Any items that... Uh, I just wanted to mention IP9, the memo from the Civil Service Commission uh, regarding four individuals that were approved as mass transit operators. And I'd like to say congratulations to them and welcome to those persons and hope that this can be a major step in getting our transit system uh, fully staffed and where it needs to be to continue to provide the quality transportation that we'd like for our community. Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention two uh, IP6 um, with the forest view, um, and uh, um, I'm sure others will probably want to chime in on this as well, but let me be the first to extend uh, a lot of gratitude to city staff, um, city manager's office, and neighborhood services, and I think Tracy was here earlier, so unfortunately wasn't able to have her be here to uh, accept uh, thanks, uh, but uh, amazing when you look at the timeline on this, mm -hmm. how quickly this came together and how much work that represented. Um, should also mention our uh, community partners, the Center of Worker Justice and uh, uh, Mazahir's work to help that neighborhood organize and figure the best possible way out of a bad situation. Um, of course, yeah, as, as much as glad to see that we were able to help and everybody got the help, it's still a bummer that 
the project that was a proposal originally. The original proposal didn't go through and this was necessary in the first place, but, uh, but again, uh, made the best out of a bad situation. And thank you to the city staff for doing that. I'll just, <clears throat> excuse me, follow on that. Um, uh, and, and thank the staff for sharing this information with us uh, and for the time that uh, everybody took to assure that these Forest View residents received the funding they deserved. I had followed that story from the very beginning when they were first told that they would need to move. I got to know many of them and admired their strength and endurance. What happened to these residents was reprehensible, to say the least. I feel the need to say that I'm very disappointed in the developer, the investors, and the landowner for literally abandoning these residents. I was very pleased that the city was able to craft a plan that provided some help for these individuals to find housing. It's sad to see that a number of the families left the city, the county, and even the state. And I wish each and every one of them the best as they move on with their lives. We have anything else on for February sixteenth? Okay, uh, we just have council updates on assigned boards, commissions, and committees. I'm going to be happy to have Councillor Burgess join me on the, and I always get it wrong too, the JEC committee, the <laughs> JECC, Joint Emergency Communications Commission. <laughs> And actually, this is a perfect opportunity for me because I did just, we had the board meeting for the uh, UNESCO City of Literature, and in fact, there is an upcoming event this weekend, and it's an awesome one. It's one book, two book. Um, and it uh, celebrates, among other things, um, young writers in the area, and it's going to be wonderful to see them on Sunday, although the, there are events on Saturday all day as well as on Sunday, but Sunday has sort of the one close to my heart because actually um, I used to be an adjudicator of these young writers and uh, right now I have a team of people who took it up themselves um, at ACT and so writing specialists nice. um, and it has become actually internally kind of this incre there's a huge amount of enthusiasm to to read these papers and to cheer these um, kiddos on and to make sure that they want to keep writing. So there will be um, an award celebration for that uh, at 1 o'clock at McBride. But the entire weekend has events um, and uh, for one book, two books. So it should be really, really cool. And once again, the City of um, Literature has done a fantastic job putting this on. So one last thing I probably should have noted earlier, but uh, an advance thank you to our city uh, street department because yes. it sounds like we're getting some freezing rain tomorrow. Um, and so hopefully everybody out there will yeah, stay home if they need to or stay safe, drive slowly. And again, thank you for getting that salt and sand on the streets for us if it, if it happens like the uh, weather is forecasting. Yeah. And now I can't seem to stop myself. However, I do want to say thank you actually for previous that dump of snow that we got on Friday night, I and my family came down and we saw that a lot of the, um, you know, where the parking spaces and the streets were, they were just completely filled with snow. I was back down the next day by nine o'clock, they were all completely gone. So kudos, I mean, that was very quick turnaround. So, and God knows you guys have been gone since Thursday when it started, so thank you. Anything else? All right, well, maybe we'll just end on that. Thank you. And um, we call ourselves adjourned, correct? Yes. Thank you for all of your help, everyone, helping guide me through this. <laughs>